It's time for our Windows Weekly. Paul Therod and Mary Jo Foley are here with an annual exercise looking back at the top 10 stories this year at Microsoft. What a year it's been. Stay tuned. Windows Weekly is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therod and Mary Jo Foley, episode 291, recorded December 20th, 2012. The Year in Review. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Ford, featuring Bliss, the blind spot information system with cross traffic alert, and Active Park Assist. Check out these available features on the 2013 Ford Fusion and 2013 Ford Taurus. Learn more at Ford.com slash technology. And by Audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, visit Audible.com slash Windows. And just for the holidays, get a copy of Brandon Sanderson's Legion absolutely free at audible.com slash Sanderson. It's time for Windows Weekly, the last episode of the year, because, of course, tomorrow the Mayan calendar ends. And since Paul and Mary Jo work on the Mayan calendar, they don't have, yes. to, they don't have to do the show anymore. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> hey, everybody. How are you? Happy holidays. It's getting to look a lot like Christmas around the old uh, studio. We, we've got glitter everywhere. Um, the wreaths, the festivities. It is very festive there. It is. it is. We decided to really dress it up. I'm wearing my 49ers scarf. Sorry about the Patriots, Paul. I'm sure that was a heartbreaker for you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I just want to be really clear about what I'm about to say. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> that was a game. Now, are you a Pats yeah, fan? Do you follow football? Yes. I know you're more basketball oriented. No, I went to uh, most home games for several years in a row. Oh, and uh, it just got it's it's a it's an awful first world kind of problem to complain about. But it's like such a long day, and uh, it is, isn't it? You know, uh, yeah. And so you know, we it's, we just get it's, together. It's a commitment. Going to a football yeah. game is a commitment. And frankly, you, yes. you see the details better on TV. Yeah, in fact, one of the games I went to was that infamous uh, snow game against the the, oh not the, 49ers, the uh, Oakland Raiders, oh my God. where Tom Brady had that forward pass. Mm -hmm. And at the stadium, all it was, you couldn't see anything. The ball looked like a piece of snow. So it was like, <laughs> we don't know, what you know, the, 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 the refs went to the side, they looked at it, they came back, Patriots ball, we went on. And so thought nothing of it. We won the game and I was driving home and called my wife and she said, what do you think about that play? I don't know anything and about I said, it. What, I don't know what he's talking about, <laughs> you know. Is My it, video has frozen again. I don't know. What are we going to do about you this? You look fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, just ignore the video. Close your okay. eyes. Pretend you're in another world. I'll just bring it up on the website and mute it. Now, next week, I don't remember. Did you guys want to do a show? Or are we doing a best of? Best of. Good. All right. So this really is the last episode of 2012. Fittingly enough, we're going to review the, uh, the year gone by. Because this may be... Uh, uh, in fact, we were talking about the big stories of 2012. Microsoft might have been, one, well, certainly was one of the dominant, if not the dominant story of 2012 in a number of ways. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, we sort of cover Microsoft, so I'm not sure how to put it in the context of the rest of technology. But I will say that from my perspective, huge. Uh, this was one of the biggest years in the history of Microsoft ever. Yeah, I agree. You know? uh, I agree. In fact, uh, this this kicks us off. So let's get started. We're going to do the year in review. Paul and Mary Jo both made a top 10 list. And uh, so we'll start ladies first. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll start with Mary Jo. Number one biggest story of the year, 2012. Yeah, I think the biggest story of this year was Microsoft changing its charter to being a devices and services company. And, you know, a, a lot of people can say that's just rhetoric, whatever, but I think it marks a really, really fundamental shift because, you know, when, when we've been writing stories all these years about Microsoft, we always say the software giant. Right. No, we don't say that anymore, right? Because they're really changing what they're doing as their fundamental businesses. Yeah. They're, in fact, that was Paul's number one story, too. In fact, probably anybody who covers Microsoft would agree. Although it did just seem like words. I mean, isn't this something Microsoft's been doing all year anyway? Uh, well, I wouldn't say, I'd say no on devices, right? 
because yeah. they never have been they didn't a have device devices. maker. Well, yeah. they have a, a be, Xbox Mices, Connect. Xboxes, Xboxes, yeah, things mice, like that. Yeah. They had that Outlook not, phone. That was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> the kin, who can forget? The yeah. Zoom, come on. The Zoom is a device, yeah. So, I mean, I, this has been a gradual change, and it's a change that's reflected in the industry as well, isn't it? Yeah, and I actually, but that's why it's amazing that Microsoft has adopted it as <laughs> their sort of motto. Yeah. No, because, uh, you know, Microsoft is not necessarily the company that's usually on the leading edge of anything these days. I mean, it's, it's a mature, long-lived company. It's kind of firmly established and so forth. And we t we've talked generally in the past about this notion that, com the f you know, the future of computing is highly mobile and highly connected. And mm -hmm. it's really easy to say stuff like that. But then when it actually happens... It's sort of interesting. And for Microsoft to be as far up on the curve as they are on this particular movement, I think it's very interesting because yeah. in the past, they always reacted to things after the fact. You know, they reacted to the Internet. Um, you know, they reacted to the iPod with Zoom. You know, it's, it's nice to see Microsoft. I mean, obviously, it's a reaction to industry trends, but they're actually also on the forefront of this move to services and devices. And I, I, I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. Well, and also their willingness to throw their um, partners under the bus. That's fantastic. I love seeing that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is is, is that fair or is that uh, is that overstating it? I don't think I don't think it's overstating it, and uh, especially now that they're selling um, the Surface in Best Buys and Staples and other retail outlets all around the world. I think it, I think if you're a Microsoft OEM partner, you're kind of going, wow, I guess they really are going to compete with us. And this wasn't just a way to incent us yep. to do better hardware. It's a varied enough ecosystem, though, isn't it, that there's still plenty of room for Lenovo and Dell and HP to play. <sighs> there is, but they're going to have to step it up because when Microsoft announced the Surface back in, what was it, June probably, obviously some of the PC makers were a little taken aback by this, were a little upset, and the theory was, well, They'll do this as an incentive to show these companies, you know, how it's done. And maybe some of them will bring their A-game to the table and we'll have the, all these great devices to play with. And that's what it didn't thought. happen. So, no. you know, every single time that a new version of Windows comes out, PC makers, for some reason, because despite the fact that this is all that they do, are slow to bringing innovative new devices to market. And so this time, I think Microsoft was not just changing the whole point of Windows, you know, making it work on devices, but was also giving these guys a heads up that, look, it really is different this time. It's so different. We're going to do it now. We're going to show you how it's done. Here's your, you know, X number of months advance peak at what we're going to do. Do the right thing. And these guys still didn't show up. And so I think they basically forced Microsoft's hand. And what we're seeing now is an escalation of their plan to distribute their own devices. Does this mean I, it surface backfired? No. No, I, it I means that PC makers are just as stupid as they were. This is what they, this is what Microsoft <laughs> was hoping would happen. Well, I I, 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 I know they keep no, saying they, no. they want there to be an ecosystem, but I, I really have doubts about the sincerity of that. Yeah, they want the ecosystem to say Microsoft on it. <laughs> I mean, remember, remember when uh, when Bill Gates and Steve Jobs were on stage at D whatever, you know, they they appeared together. And it yeah. was a big event. Yeah. And uh, one of the concessions that Bill Gates made to Steve Jobs at the time was, you know, we have our own partner based approach. Apple's approach was always to do this integrated experience. They do it all themselves. We always said that our approach would always win out. But Apple proved for us with the iPod that sometimes their approach makes sense. And, and we just talked about this notion of devices and services as the future of computing. That future of computing is more like the iPod market than it is like the old PC market. And I think there's a kind of an implicit change in Microsoft's strategy where, yes, they will continue to partner where it makes sense. But increasingly, they see the need to do it themselves because that ultimately is what's going to give people the best experience and is the thing that will sell for them. And so it's... You know, it's, it's kind of a cheap thing to say they're copying Apple, but it's really just, you know, I don't want to say copying. It's using the strategy that makes the most sense for the market you're competing in. Uh, by the way, we're going to ask the chat room. Listen closely, chat room. We're going to ask you what Paul and Mary Jo missed. I mean, I think everybody would agree that this is story one, devices and services. Yeah. And the fallout thereof, therefrom. Um, and... Um, 
But uh, we have many more. So listen carefully, chat room. You will be challenged to come up with the stories Paul and Mary Jo missed. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us where we we're wrong. And I, right, right. Uh, yeah, or maybe where their order is wrong. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is, is this really the number one story of the year? Uh, number two, Paul Thorat. What's your second top story of the year? Well, on the devices front, it's this move of Windows from something that just targets PCs to something that targets PCs and devices. And so when you look across the various platforms that Microsoft makes that are called Windows, they have a version of Windows now that runs on phones. They have one that runs on, window, on devices, you know, tablets and so forth. And then they have one that runs on uh, traditional PCs. And these things together collectively are the general purpose computing devices of today and of the future. And on Microsoft side, they're deeply aligned on the back end where they're all based on the same platform. And so slightly different approach than what Apple is doing, but similar also in some ways. Uh, but the most important thing is taking this thing that was previously very big and heavy, and it's still obviously big and heavy in some ways, and bringing it down to much more portable devices that, again, matches that vision that Microsoft has of the future. I said, yes, you know, yesterday we had Harry McCracken, longtime editor of PC World on triangulation. Mm -hmm. And I submitted to him, and, I'm, and actually I'd be curious what you think, because you may violently disagree with this. That, violently? That of the, yeah, violently. <laughs> Thank God you're in another part of the country. Uh, that of the three uh, big uh, Windows 8 announcements, Windows 8 for the desktop, Windows RT, and mm -hmm. Windows Phone 8, I would say arguably Windows Phone 8 is the truest and best success of the three, that that really reflects. Interesting. To me. I, I, will, I will say this. Um, you know, Windows RT and, and Windows 8 are somewhat constrained by the fact that they have to maintain some kind of backwards compatibility with the past, meaning the desktop environment. And in Windows 8's case, obviously, compatibility with that environment, uh, third-party apps and so forth. Um, on that note, though, Windows RT is in some ways, I think, a purer representation of what Microsoft intends for Windows to become and that it's just an, an element of time that they had to ship something now because this is the schedule but maybe for Windows 9 or whatever that future release is called three years down the road Windows RT in particular drops the desktop environment entirely or it's optional or you know something like that where the Metro platform has evolved to the point where they don't need that anymore mm. you know I think Windows Phone benefits from not needing that element of compatibility and today it's sort of like i think what you were suggesting that the purest form of this modern windows right, platform or right. whatever. but i think these things are going to converge more I, I i suspect on the windows 8 9 side not the rt side that you'll see the desktop environment continue longer because that will give microsoft the inroad they need to the desktop pc environment you know that will still be very important in businesses and for backwards compatibility and for all that stuff but um, you know, again, I, I, the Windows on ARM, you know, or Windows RT has always been a little confusing, but I, I think we need to look at it in the perspective of it's the future, you know, yeah. and as the ARM yes. platform itself improves, it's very possible and maybe even likely that that platform represents Windows of the future. Okay. It's just that it's not quite there yet today. Okay. So you don't. So I don't really. You don't I don't. I don't disagree. No, no. It's the it's the um, um, platonic, don't have a platonic ideal of Windows Eight. The what idea? The platonic ideal of Windows Eight. The platonic idea of Windows Eight. <laughs> Never mind. Just forget I said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a wordsmith, Leo. But <laughs> <laughs> you play one on the internet. <laughs> Uh, number uh, two for you, Mary Jo Foley. What's your second yeah, my, biggest story? My number two was um, the Surface because this was the first time Microsoft made and sold its own PC, which we've said on the show a few times. And every time we say it, we're like, wow. It's hard to believe. So weird. It doesn't seem I right. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't seem right. And um, I, I think it was really amazing thinking back ahead of June that nobody really knew what that big announcement was, that secret announcement they had outside of L.A. and when they did announce it, everybody was like, wow, they're really doing this. Like there have been rumors, you know, for a couple of years ahead, like maybe they're going to get into the PC market, but no one really believed it. So I think it was really amazing. They pulled this off as a surprise. And I think it's very key to the whole services and devices charter change, that whole change in statement that they made. 
Um, and I have to say, this weekend, this past weekend, I went and finally bought a type keyboard for my Surface. And up Love until it. then, I had been liking my Surface RT because I was using it with a touch cover. But wow, with the type cover, this is great. Yeah. This device to me is finally like really, really usable and something I'm using a ton more just because I can actually type really quickly. But right haven't now. you made it a laptop now? Really? Yeah, but that's okay. Yeah. It's a tablet it's or a, a pa- PC. Tablet. <laughs> <laughs> tablet. <laughs> and it's not going to catch on, I hate to tell you. <laughs> I know. It's never going to catch on. I keep trying. Futilely trying. <laughs> PC tablet. They sort, yeah. of, they sort of killed the term pa- tablet PC, unfortunately, because that's really, it's a tablet PC. Yeah. It is a tablet PC. It is. It, cause it's, it is. It doesn't quite work as a tablet because it just kind of feels a little clunky. And I think, I think oddly enough, maybe because I'm so poisoned by iPad, 16.9 feels weird. Uh, yeah. But well, except if you have an iPhone 5. I know. It's the that, new thing. That, that, that feels has a weird really to me, too. stretched out screen. Yeah. yeah. Weird to me is, I think the weirder thing is just that they have different aspect ratios right. and different devices. Right. Yeah. It's a little confusing. Um, on the other hand, um, it works very well, I think, as, as, a, as a laptop. Mm-hmm. It kind of wants to be a laptop, I guess, is what I would say. Well, I, yeah. you know, again, as app availability increases on Windows RT slash 8, and by the way, it has pretty dramatically already. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, this thing's viability as a tablet becomes more and more true, right? I mean, it's it's already, it's getting there. It's happening pretty quick. Tis indeed. Item number, uh, let's see, we did two for you, right, Paul? Mm-hmm. So number three for you, Paul Therott, your third yeah, I mean, on the, of the year. On the other side of the devices and services coin is, of course, services. And I actually, I, across Microsoft's businesses, this is maybe the area of the greatest change at Microsoft and their biggest success, where this is a company that has made billions and billions of dollars selling traditional software to consumers and to businesses And they're switching everything over to a services model, either by making them into pure services, which they'll sell side by side with the traditional versions, things like Exchange, SharePoint, all of their server products. You know, you can uh, purchase or license as on-premises servers or as online services, which is amazing. Or in in the case of some software where it really has to be software that you install locally regardless, still treating it as a service. You know, think even Windows 8 is like that a little bit. And the next version of Office, Office 2013, is like that a lot. Yeah. And I really think that by the time that generation of Office is through, that the version you buy as part of a subscription through Office 365 and you consume as a service, and it's something that you can install very quickly over the Internet to multiple devices and device types, is going to be the one that sells the best. And that is an amazing transition. When you, when you talk about technology transitions, you know, Apple is always the... The topic, you know, they made the move from classic OS uh, 9 or whatever to OS 10. They made the transition from PowerPC to Intel. I would say that this transition at Microsoft is as big or bigger than any of that kind of thing. It's, it's an amazing transition because they've basically taken their whole business, all of their businesses, and said, reimagine this as a service. Let's make it happen. And this year, I think, they crossed that kind of Rubicon where they're on the other side of it, where... The online services versions of these products are superior and will continue to be so going forward. And that the on-prem versions will basically disappear over time. Huge. Yeah, really Huge. big. Yeah. Um, number three for you, Mary Jo Foley. Yeah, my number three is basically Paul's number two. So my, my third <laughs> one was Windows 8 and Windows RT debut. Um, we we you got and, it wrong was we made it number three. <laughs> <laughs> I actually thought the Surface was a bigger deal than Windows 8 itself. I would and, agree and with had, you. I would agree with you, yeah. And, and you know, one reason is I, I think we're just starting to realize this now, but um, I was surprised there were not more Windows 8 and Windows RT PCs and tablets in the market when Windows 8 launched. So was Microsoft. I mean, here we are. Well, some people say it was Microsoft's fault. Some say it's other things going on with drivers and Mm. the whole approval process. But um, here we are, you know, Windows 8 and Windows RT did get out the door right around the time everybody was pretty much predicting. That wasn't too much of a surprise. Uh, But what what I am kind of surprised about is there, there 
are there are starting to be more of more devices for this, these operating systems coming to market, but there aren't really that many yet. And OEMs had quite a bit of uh, heads up as to when this thing was going to ship and when the launch was going to be. So in some ways, kind of surprising. It feels it feels to me almost like Windows 7 did. I remember when Windows 7 came out, I was like, okay, where are all the new PCs for this thing that are supposed to really yeah. showcase the operating system? And it took a while for those to come to market. And I feel like we're kind of seeing that repeat again here with Windows 8, even though with Windows 8, you really do need to, or you really do want touch PCs to, to truly show off the experience. Yeah. You agree, Paul? Yeah, definitely. In fact, it's even worse, I'd say, with Windows 8, because again, they're positioning it for this new generation of devices. I mean... At least with you know Windows Seven, I think we're going to look back on it as the last great operating system for traditional PCs. You yeah. know, yeah, um, it may. Oh, well, it's hard to know what's going to happen in the future. I mean, it's sold it's sold today close to seven what seven hundred million copies, basically, right? I mean, it's amazing. Um, huge success story for Microsoft, but also the last of its kind. You know. So anyway, the, the point being that when Windows Seven came out, that. Um, you know, the PC types were basically the same types of PCs you would see for Win Windows Vista or whatever. Um, and the, the innovations that were occurring at the time were mostly around netbooks, you know, low-cost low PCs. Whereas one of the nice things that happened during the lifetime of Windows 7 was the advent of the Ultrabook, which is uh, an awesome kind of modern take on the laptop. Um, and now with Windows 8, we have the opportunity to go multi-touch on all those Traditional PC form factors, but also new device types. And so, you know, the like we said before, the PC makers really dropped the ball on this transition. And I, I got to say, the one thing I'm, uh, another thing besides the lateness of the machines that's surprising me is the battery life of the machines. And maybe this is going to change. Hopefully it's going to change. Uh-oh, she's frozen. Her battery probably <laughs> died. No. Oh, oh. There you go. No, oh, my battery's alive. <laughs> But, you know, like to see all these, the, some of these new form factors that have come out so far coming to market with like four hour and five hour battery life, it just seems yes. wrong. It seems like, Inexcusable. okay, w wait a second here. Like what happened? Should they be 10? Yeah. 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 Eight to I 10, yeah. Should. Of course they should. I, I think the one thing that Microsoft did get right with the Surface is the battery life. Yeah. Um, and the only yeah. machine, I, I mean, uh, I don't remember on the. Well, the Surface auto, RT, right? Not with yeah. sur Surface Pro. No, not the regular. <laughs> we'll see on the regular Surface. But the uh, the Samsung ATIV Smart PC I have, which is that Clover Trail based uh, tablet, also gets you know eight hours of battery life or whatever. Or no, actually, it's more than that. I think it's nine hours of battery life. Um, that's exactly where it should be. Yeah. Your uh, number four, Paul, is uh, the Metro. Or whatever. <laughs> Windows Experience. I'm, I'm, I'm going to call it Metro until the Metro AG goes back. out of business and they take that name back. <laughs> I have no idea what happened there. But um, this is one that's going to be controversial for people because I get a lot of pushback from uh, the power user crowd, especially, who doesn't really? understand huh. um, how this full screen interface thing can work. I, I will say, I was, it's funny, I, I just today I was looking at some Metro apps, you know, Microsoft updated their mail and calendar and messaging and uh, people app on Windows 8 today. And I have to say, I think in their maybe a little too crazy push for simplicity, um, one of the things that Microsoft got wrong perhaps with Metro is that they're hiding interfaces and that when you look at something like the calendar app, it's not clear to me why you wouldn't want that toolbar up all of the time. <laughs> you know, like they just hide things. And so you have to, there's a learning curve with Metro where you have to know the secrets for bringing up things you know, that there's a hidden app bar usually that will have additional functionality on it and that they're trying to hide that Chrome from the user. And I sort of get that, but even, you know, even now I, I find myself pushing back myself against some of this stuff. But the message from Microsoft is that simplicity is always going to win the battle over complexity. Um, what you lose is some of that advanced functionality that people so love, you know, multiple floating windows, mm -hmm. you know, the ability to tile app, you know, apps in windows on the screen, multi-monitor support and all that stuff. Um, there, there's always going to be a certain crowd of people that doesn't understand why that might be going away, kind of. And it's not, not that it's truly going to go away, but that the mainstream computing environment of the future is a lot simpler than that, you know. And this is, again, is Microsoft really putting a fairly controversial stake in the ground and saying, 
look, uh, this is the way it's going this way. You know, sorry if you don't agree with it. You can push back all you want. You can complain about it all you want, but we're doing it. And they never caved on all of the complaints. Why can't we do it this way? Why can't we have this? Why can't, you know, they, this is the way it is moving forward. And, um, you know, again, I'm not suggesting that it's good, bad, or indifferent, um, but I am suggesting that it's happening whether you want it to or not. And uh, it's, I think, one of the big, big things they did, and they do it across the board. Uh, across the various products, but especially in the Windows products. Um, you know, full screen experiences and, and Windows, at least, Windows RT and 8, no Chrome, no Chrome at all. Yeah, I like that, actually. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, we're talking with Paul Throt and Mary Jo Foley and taking a look back at 2012, the year in Microsoft in review, and we will continue in just a moment. I should mention... That the the one of the biggest stories that uh, certainly caused Mary Jo to actually scream out loud and Paul Thorat to crash <laughs> off the road has not been mentioned yet, but will be soon. <laughs> but see, if Paul, if you'd had active lane assist, I was I, I was excited about the Amra acquisition. Is that what you're referring? <laughs> That's to? the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you'd had Ford technology, the the problem would have been much less serious. You see. I, I'm excited, actually. I'm, I'm being a little facetious, obviously. But uh, I'm very excited about uh, where Ford is going with technology in the automobile. Really uh, taking the car to the 21st century. In fact, they have a whole page devoted to it. Ford.com slash technology. That's where you can find about Sync and all the commands you can use with Sync and my Ford Touch. Uh, that's where you can find about the API to the automobile. They call it AppLink. They treat the automobile as a platform the developers can develop to. That is, nobody's doing that. That is so cool. All sorts of interesting things. You've seen the ads lately for the hands-free lift gate. This, just, this is the kind of simple thing that just is wonderful, changes the world. And when you come to really high tech, they're doing some stuff that's actually kind of amazing. Have you seen the Bliss, the blind spot information system? You've got radar in the car in a number of places, including in both left and right rear panels on the fender there that can detect cars in your blind spot. So, you know, on both sides, there's places in the mirrors you can't see oncoming traffic. Bliss will warn you with an audible alert and a little light in the in the side mirrors that say, hey, there's a car there. Don't go. It's useful, too, for parking. When you're pulling out of a parking space and your view is obstructed by big cars or trucks, It'll let you know there's oncoming traffic. I, I've used this, and it is a lifesaver. Well, it's at least a fender saver. Bliss is available in the 2013 Ford Fusion or 2013 Ford Taurus and other vehicles. I've already driven and played with the Active Park Assist. I drove a Ford Flex with this, and I was so blown away. Once you locate a parking space, and does it automatically, by the way. It measures the spaces as you're going by and says, that one, you can fit into that one. It says, then pull forward. And press a button and then take your hands off the wheel because I'll take it from here. This is, you know, you weren't talking about autonomous vehicles. This is the first step in autonomous vehicles. The idea that a car, an automobile can, or a vehicle could park itself, spinning the wheel. And it does it perfectly, by the way. You know all the geometric rules you were taught? It knows. Six inches from the curb, 24 seconds. You're fully parked. Hassle-free. If parallel parking drives you crazy, this is great. Even if it doesn't. I know because we're all technologists. This is a taste of what's to come. And you can find out more at Ford.com slash technology. Or better yet, go further. Visit a Ford dealer and say, I want to test drive the Bliss, the Active Park Assist. My next uh, vehicle is going to be a plug-in hybrid, uh, the Ford Fusion. I'm very excited about that. They have, uh, they have um, an app on your, on your phone that will tell you the state of the uh, the charge and all that. I cannot wait. I've already told Ford. I want the first Ford Fusion Energy to in the state of California. I want it. I want it. I'll take it. <laughs> Ford.com slash technology. Well, there was a big story, a huge story, a number four on Mary Jo Foley's list, the shakeup in the Microsoft management. Hey, it takes a lot to get Mary Jo Foley to scream. <laughs> It does. It does. But um, there's a reason I didn't make this my number one story. And the reason is uh, Stephen Sadowski leaving is obviously what we're talking about. The reason I didn't make it my number one story was I don't think things are going to change too much in the Windows org because of this. Uh, Microsoft immediately put 
two of his handpicked lieutenants in charge, Tammy Reller and Julie Larson Green. And although I have felt some change in terms of getting questions answered a little more quickly um, and a little glimmer of hope that there could be a little more increased transparency. I, otherwise, I don't know how much of a change there's going to be. Um, but I, I did think it was important enough to make number four because um, Sanofsky had had an impact not just on Windows, but on a lot of other divisions inside the company in that his whole uh, change in how the organization should be structured was really permeating. Uh, he has this idea of functional management where um, teams are organized around functions instead of products. And that had started being adopted in Office and Windows Server in Azure. So it had already started going throughout the company as, as a new way of, of organization. So I think that he is going to have, a, a, you know, that impact's going to remain. Um, but I think we are going to see some changes. So I think this is this is something that is worth putting on the list as a big story, though not number one. Yeah, I mean, I think in some in some cases people would say that's a big that's the biggest story of all. But I, but it's interesting that you you just you, continuity is going to be a part of the Microsoft. Uh, I think so. I think so. Uh, yeah, company going forward. And Julie Larson Green seems to be focused on that, doesn't she? She does. Yeah. She does. Uh, we found we found out this week that um, Stephen Sanofsky is going to be um, as of next year teaching part time at Harvard uh -huh. Business School. That's prestigious. Um, and he's, Yes, uh, he's done that before. He's he's doing it as part of a sabbatical where he's doing research and writing and teaching there. Um, Paul went on Twitter and invited <laughs> him to dinner at his house yeah. uh, once he found out because he'd be yeah. neighbors. And so yeah. Stephen yep. came back and said, uh, somebody else said, Mary Jo could go too. You guys could all have dinner together. And Stephen came back and said, only if I get to do the cooking. Wow. A little ominous, I thought. Mm, <laughs> does that mean he might, hmm... Yeah, See, I took it to mean cooking. that he was afraid that if someone else cooked, we would try to poison him. You, Mary Jo's taking quite the opposite. <laughs> but <am>. Stephen <laughs> Lucretia uh, Borgia Sanofsky, is that what you're saying? You as know, I told, saying. I think I told Mary Jo the story. I, uh, I was heading out to go to my daughter's winter concert thing, and right when this happened on Twitter, and I just, when I saw he was going to be at Harvard, I just kind of blurted out on Twitter this dinner invitation thing and I walked around the corner and I told my wife you know I just invited Steven Sanofsky to dinner <laughs> and I actually I, I don't know what made her ask me this but she said did you ask him this privately or publicly oh she and asked said, the right publicly. question <laughs> and I said publicly and she said you're an idiot <laughs> <laughs> that was the right question Paul oopsies so now you got to do it I think it's great of I course you have to do, do that I would yeah, yeah. Is Sanofsky known for uh, his cooking? I don't, well, no, that's not really the point. Um, <laughs> let me, let me Google I, Stephen I, Sanofsky recipes. You know what happens, though? I, I think that just speaking from sort of an adult relationship standpoint, I think a lot of problems simply get cleared up when people just talk. You know, that I agree. I have whatever problems I may have I with agree. men. Um, you know. I'm not I saying we're going to be best buds forever. Walk a mile in my uh, in my uh, chafing dish, and <laughs> and you will see. Sure. Yeah, I think you All sit I'm down around we have a nice a, meal. We have, a, we have a farm dinner about once every two weeks, and Aww. good food, drink. You know, that's all. That's all I'm saying. I love the idea. And if you can, we'll put some cameras around and uh, we'll make it my dinner with Steven. It'll be great. It really, it's not designed to be a PR opportunity. <laughs> no, I, I know. No, in fact, it's a great look. At or what, a poisoning, I should point No, that. no. What better way to build a bridge and, sure. by the way, to find out what the hell was going on? Plus, maybe I could get into the class. <laughs> no, that would be, uh, you, you could bet Harvard students would be uh, running to get to that class. That's exciting. Uh, number four for, I'm sorry, number five for Paul Therott, because we just did Metro, is one account to rule them all. Yeah, now, Microsoft's always had this one account, right? It used to be Passport. It was Windows Live ID for a long time, and then Microsoft changed it to Microsoft account this right. year. And it seems like kind of a small story in a way, but I actually think that this is very important. I know that, obviously, Google has their own account that they use across all the services, and, um, you know, Apple does, obviously, as well. But this kind of thing is... I think the key aspect to the ecosystems that each of these companies is trying to push and by consolidating it around something that makes a lot more sense and is a lot friendlier. You know, the Microsoft account works across 
all of their entertainment services across all of you know you, you can use it to uh, badly but you can use it to log on to office 365 you can use it to log on to the xbox you can use it to log on to your computer you know they've made it a a central point of contact for everything that you do and uh, you know some people complain that the microsoft account and that you know something like uh, hotmail or outlook.com doesn't support the the two-factor authentication that Google has on its own accounts. But actually, Microsoft has something very close to that, such that when I uh, start a new, you know, uh, log onto a new PC for the first time or log into my account on a Windows phone or log into my account on whatever for the first time, I actually have to go through a text messaging service code to okay that thing. And, you, you know, in the case of a computer market, it's a trusted PC and so forth. And that they do have a form of... Um, it's it's pretty close to what you know to what Google offers, and so uh, I think this year they they basically formalized this whole process uh, and really matured it in a big big way. And so I think they've kind of set this up for you know going forward that uh, this notion of one account to rule them all uh, is something that Microsoft has sort of had for a long time, but now finally does does that. I'd agree. Number five, Mary Jo Foley. You had to get Azure in here somewhere. I had to. Of course I did. No Hadoop? <laughs> Wait. Be patient. Um, announcement that I don't think still has gotten its full due. But Microsoft announced this year that you can host in a persistent virtual machine on Azure, Linux, and Windows Server. Um, so before you could kind of do this, but now you can do it in a way that you can actually run uh, Linux applications and Windows Server applications, obviously, like SQL Server and SharePoint, right uh, on top of Windows Azure. So before this, Microsoft was definitely more of a platform as a service play in the cloud. But at, with this announcement, they really stepped up their competition with Amazon, and they're really now playing also in the infrastructure as a service space. And so what one interesting thing to remember is this is still a preview, the Linux VM on Azure, and we don't know when it's going to go final still. But it's definitely something a lot of people are kicking the tires on. And I've heard people say that it works really well and they're impressed. And they see this as a kind of a gateway for them to try out Azure and then ultimately make more of a commitment there uh, to Microsoft's public cloud. So it was a really big deal when they announced this this sure. year. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Azure. Azure. Azure, Azure. Number uh, six was the same as Mary Jo's number uh, four, you rank the Steven Sanofsky uh, departure as less, even less important than Mary Jo does, Paul. Well, I, <laughs> it's in the top ten. I mean, I, I, I think the big, the only thing I would add to the Steven Sanofsky thing is that it's very clear his legacy will continue there for some time to come. You know, the people that he left in place, uh, or that have been left in place, whoever did it, uh, Tammy Reller and Julie Larson Green, um, you know, came from his world, and in Julie Larson Green's case, certainly she was uh, what I would consider a lieutenant of his and a close confidant, and so forth. And so, um, she hasn't come out too much publicly, but her one appearance in MIT Technology Review or whatever suggested that things aren't going to change too much. <laughs> so, um, his legacy is probably going to continue for quite some time. And uh, as Mary Jo did point out, you know, obviously he impacted product groups outside of his own purview as well, very dramatically. I mm -hmm. mean, mm -hmm. this is something we saw across not all of the company, but a lot of the company where they clearly were adopting his management style and, um, you know, in some cases to their detriment, in some cases to their whatever the opposite of detriment is, their advantage, <laughs> I guess. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I don't have too much to add to the yeah. Sanofsky story, I guess. Are you going to, you know, one thing you might suggest to him at dinner, you could write his biography. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, knowing him, um, I'm, I'm sure that he will be writing his own biography. I'm going to suggest yeah. the title could be I Did It My Way. Right. right? <laughs> Volume one. Volume pages one, one through <laughs> 1500. <laughs> the early years. <laughs> yeah. Now we're going to get. I, I, would, I would be happy to edit there you go. <laughs> that book. Just get a little glimpse at it a little ahead of time. Yeah. Um, now we get into the weeds. We're down. We're down below the top five. Mary Jo Foley with number six. Now we're getting serious here. Yeah. Now we're getting serious. We're Shout talking. out to the Hyper V fan club on Windows Weekly, of course, <laughs> because there are a lot of them who listen to the show who love Hyper V. Love and it. Love my it. my number six pick is Windows Server 2012, which 
you know, we all, we talk a lot about Windows 8 on the show here, but Windows Server 2012, the complement, um, had 300 new features, and they were all really big features, um, including a much more uh, robust version of Hyper-V, um, Hyper-V Replica, which is a di disaster recovery solution. Um, man, there's just so many, too many to list. And, of course, PowerShell. PowerShell 3.0, um, also a really big set of enhancements around that hybrid applications, multi-tenancy. So I, I, I talked to a lot of people who said, actually they considered Windows Server 2012 to be a more important and bigger release than Windows 8 itself. So for all, all of our uh, enterprise listeners, I'm sure this is not a surprising pick on my list. No. But there you go. No, they love it. They're eating it up. <laughs> Number seven for Paul Thorat. Since you got uh, Hyper-V and Paul's got to get in. <laughs> I love Hyper-V. I want to be clear about that. Yeah, okay. But there's one thing you love even more. That's true. Your Xbox. Yeah. Now, I spend a lot of time on my Xbox. In fact, I spend maybe 99 point something percent of my time on the Xbox. <laughs> when you're not <laughs> Playing asleep. one game. <laughs> but but it's the point is I play games on the Xbox. But I think one of the more interesting trends this year was that Microsoft revealed that for the first time ever, more time was spent on the Xbox using non-game entertainment mm. apps, you know, wow. Netflix, uh, Xbox Video, and so forth, than gaming. And so what I would describe as today's premier video game console is actually used more often to do things that have nothing to do with video gaming. And I think that's a, a hint at where they're heading with this device yep. in the future. So yep. I, the very, very, very interesting uh, change for the Xbox. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I just bought uh, for the uh, for Christmas for uh, a young lad. I bought a uh, an Xbox and Connect, mm -hmm. Halo, Assassin's yep. Creed, the new one, nice. four, I guess, which is the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, and uh, I didn't get Call of Duty because he's ten, even though that's yeah. all he plays ever. Sure, <laughs> I'm not going to encourage it. <laughs> and uh, let's see, Halo, the new Halo, the new Assassin's Creed, and Dance Dance Revolution. <laughs> Enough said. I, yeah. Do you ever do that? Those dancing games, Paul? Really? <laughs> really, good. Leo? Oh yeah, love those. I probably should, but no. no, you shouldn't. Do you do you use Connect at all? No. Hmm. No. I, you know, part of the reason is our living room is too small. You know, that you initial big, yeah, you need a big uh, throw. It's, yeah, it's just not. It's not deep enough. Yeah. So yeah. I'm hoping that with the next Xbox, I was hoping they would fix it before then, but I can see why they didn't. Um, maybe with the next one, they'll that will be something they address. Am I crazy to buy an Xbox 360 when the 720 is going to be announced in June? And we and we know this because it's it's been announced. No, I mean I, honestly, I no. I I, if I so had either. to, no. it's a good product. I, It'll we'll get yeah, at least really six is. months out of it. And the other thing is, it will continue to work. Obviously, the games always will go, and there'll be new Xbox games for some time to come, but. You know, the entertainment stuff on there will work for a long, long time as well. It's a great set-top box. I agree. You know, it's it's the most versatile set-top box in many ways. Yeah. Uh, too, so. I agree. Um, number eight for Mary jo Oh, no, number seven for Mary Jo seven. Foley. Somehow yeah. I got out of sequence. Go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, so my seven also is a lot like a, an earlier pick Paul had when he talked about services and I, my focus is on subscriptions uh, with my pick. I said uh, Microsoft stepping up its whole subscription push uh, was my number seven pick. And what I mean by that is um, Microsoft's really trying to make it more enticing for people to rent software instead of buy software. And this is what they're doing with Office 2013, obviously, where they're uh, allowing you to buy a single year's subscription and you can run Office on up to five devices, PCs and Macs so far in this case. Uh, they're doing this with Windows Intune too, which is their PC management service. Um, they're going to have a subscription-based pricing of $6 per user per month for that um, with the newest release. And that lets you run Windows Intune, not just on Windows PCs and Macs, but also on iPhones, on iPads, um, on Android tablets and Android phones, and Windows Phone 8, obviously, too. So uh, this, is a, this is a new thing. You're going to be seeing a lot more from Microsoft, um, not just services in the cloud, like, like with Office 365 and subscriptions, but now also 
extending down to consumers and home users too. So I think that's a really significant shift and something that you're going to be seeing more of in the coming year too. I have to agree. I'm excited about it, in fact. Yeah, it's holding, interesting. Holding off on the buying office uh, until I can get that subscription version of for the Mac, I mean. Because it's still not on the Mac, it's just on the Windows, right? Uh, right. Uh, the, the I guess Mac if I bought it now, I'd get the Mac version when it came out, right? I, I think the way it's going to work in the beginning is that the, the version for the Mac will be the current version of Mac Office yeah. that's out now. Right. And then eventually there'll be some, uh, some future more. upgrade. Yeah, got it. Your your pick, Paul, <laughs> brings to a close <laughs> a <laughs> yeah. long-running chapter. I actually, as I was making this list, it occurred to me that a lot of what I was putting on the list was about other things going away. Mm. You know, the Xbox entertainment stuff killed off the Zune. The Microsoft account killed off Windows Live ID, which, of course, was killed off, you know, period, Windows Live as a brand. I mean, there was actually a lot of that going on this year. You know, Microsoft kind of trimming the, the tree a bit. And uh, the one kind of uh, scraggly bit that, you know, Microsoft has had a really hard time getting rid of. In fact, I, I'm faced with this every time I go up into our upstairs bathroom because we use a a cup to hold our toothbrushes that has a an IE countdown logo on it, you know, is this, uh, you know, the, the that's, that's anti roadshow <laughs> material. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, well, it's, it's Microsoft has been trying for a long time now to get rid of Windows XP and Internet Explorer 6, which is part of Windows XP. And so I think this year for the first time, usage in XP dipped below the 50 percentile mark. And, you know, Windows 7 has, has picked up the slack and, uh, and it, it, it's it's amazing to me. So I, I just got an email as we were going online. Uh, a guy wrote me and said, "You know, I I want to buy your book Windows Eight Secrets, but I saw I wrote I read in the beginning. It uh, assumes you, you know Windows Seven. I'm actually coming at this from Windows XP. Does that mean I won't understand your book? <laughs> you know, and it's like wow. yikes. I mean, um, and it's it's you know if you travel at all, I get on trains and planes, and you see people using Windows XP out in the real world, and you just want to cry. I mean, it's so so out of date. Um, but this is the OS that just will, refuses to die. I'm actually uh, finally, using it finally I'm right yeah, now it. on this, on this computer. Really? Yeah. Well, the reason is it's the call screening computer Yeah. Uh, that's calling uh, the radio stations for the show I do. And uh, they're running software that is vintage 2006, and I don't I sure. don't dare do anything. You don't want to mess with it. Yeah, no. I, I don't. And way, that's, that's probably why XP is running in a if lot of you, places. If you were to strip away the particulars of what you just said, that's probably exactly why a lot of people yeah. are using Windows yeah. XP. Right? Yeah. It still works. I get it. You it know? works, and it's doing a very specific job that I don't dare mess with. Yeah. Well, it's finally going away. <laughs> and I have to say, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy about it. I mean, obviously, XP was great for its day. Yeah. Um, but you know, so was the Packard, I guess. Um, Which is a great car, also. Perhaps I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I focus on the future. Am later. I going to stop getting uh, updates to this thing? Yeah. So the official cutoff point for that is what April two thousand fourteen. Mm. Yeah. Is that right? I got a year. Yeah, so we have uh, quite a ways to go before that happens. But I don't run Windows XP at all, so I don't really know what it's like. But I assume that the update picture hasn't gotten you know, better, right? I mean, I, I, I assume there's not much going on there. There's probably just, uh, you know, KB articles associated with bug fixes and so forth. Yeah, we get, we get picks, fixes. Security fixes, yeah. 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 Like this, I just ran Windows Update, so this website uses ActiveX. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Windows XP is a great choice if you need to run ActiveX. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're mocking it, but that probably a lot of line of business software does use ActiveX, right? And yeah. IE6. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough. You know, when, when you're in a, a business and someone wrote an app for you, right. a web app, whatever it is, years ago when they're gone yeah. and no one knows how to maintain yeah. that thing or change it. It's I mean, working. I'm not going to mess with it. Yeah. Change, change is hard. So I, I get it. I'm not, I'm not ridiculing anyone for using XP. Well, maybe some people I am. No, but, uh, you know, obviously there are, there are business reasons why people do that. But um, I think that this year was notable because this is the, you know, for the first time, it seemed like this thing was never going to go away. I mean, Microsoft kept extending the life cycle. I don't really so, like it when I go in a bank and I see them running. And actually, what oh. you see is Windows XP. Um, I actually see Windows Two Thousand sometimes. Yeah, even. and you yeah. see those screensavers, and you go, "Oh, that's 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 concerning." 
I saw a window, I think it was Windows 2000 in the T, you know, my, uh, the Boston subway oh, system yeah, sure. on a screen. And yeah. I thought to myself, this isn't why this company is doing so poorly, but it's an indication that they're not making some good decisions, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> let's see, number eight for Mary Jo Foley is kind of a lower version of uh, Paul's earlier pick for <laughs> Windows Phone 8, right? Yeah. You don't give it as much credence. Um, you know, so yeah, my pick eight, number eight is Windows Phone 8. And I guess I, I give it, I give it some credence because, um, number one, it got, a, it got a lot of new business features in addition to getting the NT core. And so for our listeners who care about business, it got, um, encryption, it got advanced side loading capabilities. It has the company app hub, still does not have, uh, VPN capabilities that supposedly could, maybe possibly be something in the next update to windows phone this thing called apollo plus if the rumors are right uh but yeah it, it it was a big deal for business users and for us verizon customers here um it was a very big deal because now verizon is somewhat more committed to the windows phone platform we have the htc 8x for one thing which is great um given that's one of the flagship phones for windows phone 8 and it's on verizon uh, so it feels like there's a lot of um, hope for the platform and push for the platform. Uh, the Lumia 920s got pretty good reviews. The 8X got pretty good reviews. In fact, I think Paul wrote a story this week saying it got consumer reports picked, didn't you it? You did, yeah. The HTC 8X, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and, um, nine, so and that, the 920 as well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's a big deal, you know. Um, uh, so I, I, I think Windows Phone 8, obviously a big release, um, not a ton of new features that were more like consumer facing features. I mean, there were quite a few, but mostly it was an under the cover kind of a release where they were bringing the two sets of APIs and the two kernels of, of Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8 closer together. So kind of an interim release, I felt like moving the platforms to be more unified. Actually, I, I take it back. Paul, you didn't even give it number eight. You gave it number nine. <laughs> I don't have much to add to what she just said. I, I think that uh, Windows 8, Windows Phone 8 is an important release for obvious reasons. It's like Windows 8. It's It's got a lot of little missing things that they need to fix over the next year. And we're already seeing this indication that they can move a little more quickly than they did in the past. I got my first ever over-the-air software update for Windows Phone, uh, not excluding the beta period from uh, summer 2010 when I thought that stuff was going to happen all the time and then it never did. Um, I almost cried when this thing appeared on my phone. I couldn't believe it. You know, it's like a the stupidest little thing, you know, that people just regularly get on other phones. But it was so awesome to see an update actually appear. Um, so, you know, hopefully they get it right. I mean, obviously there's a little bit of work to be done, but this sets them up nicely, I think, for the future. So, yeah, I, I love Windows Phone 8. Boy, I'm surprised, though, that you guys ranked it so low. Well, I'm trying to put it in the perspective of the whole company. Right. It's not low. It's, it's, in, it's in the top yeah. 10. Top 10. No, and like you, like you said at the start, Leo, there was so much Microsoft news this right. year. Like just trying to limit the yeah. list to 10 was kind of hard. I, yeah, that's true. that's true. I did everything I could to get Hadoop in this list, Leo, but. <laughs> <laughs> I well, didn't even put it on Mary the list. Mary Jo has oh. two more chances, <laughs> two more slots. <laughs> Her number nine pick is Metro. Uh, number nine. Yeah, Metro. And I, I thought, you know, no a lot more. of people, <laughs> right, a lot of people poo-pooed, like, the fact that Microsoft is backing away from the Metro name. But I actually think that was pretty significant because they had invested so much in this brand. I mean, no. they it, it's true. It, they they called it a code name, um, technically. But they whenever they talked about what their over overarching message was about Windows Phone and Windows and Xbox, it was they all have the Metro look and feel. So suddenly, for some reason, which we think was a legal reason, they can no longer use the Metro name. And then we had this whole confusion. So what do you use instead? Do you call it Windows Store apps? Do you call it modern apps? Do you call it immersive apps? And um, I don't know. I, I, I know some people thought this was just a thing that concerned journalists more than anyone else, but I disagree. I think it really came at a really bad time right before they launched Windows 8. And we're still kind of Trying to figure out what to use as uh, oh. as a. Uh, I'll, I'll finish their sentence since she's frozen solid. <laughs> there you go. Oh, frozen. Go ahead. go ahead. Frozen. I was going to say sometimes it creates more confusion than not now because, what like we, what you do we say call to somebody, it? yeah, yeah, 
I, I'm talking about a Windows Store app. Do you mean a Metro app? Well, I can't call it Metro now. So what am I talking about? You know? yeah, right. <laughs> um, but, you know, all, all that said, with the confusion around the name, I agree with Paul that it's still a very significant thing because Metro is the future for what apps are going to look like for Microsoft across all of its platforms. And I thought it was very interesting this year that most of the Metro apps that we've seen in the Windows Phone Store and the Windows Store have been developed with the traditional technologies uh, like the .NET and XAML, Silverlight technologies, uh, rather than Microsoft's preferred choice, which is HTML5 and JavaScript. Right. Uh, let's see. Number 10. I can't believe it. We've got to the end of the lists. <laughs> Paul Thorat's 10th pick, and then we'll do Mary Jo's. Well, Surface, right? And it's funny because I've been fairly critical of the first Surface device, um, but I don't think we can understate, overstate, I guess we can't overstate how important this is to Microsoft. Um, they've obviously made devices in the past and so forth, but this is Microsoft's craziest and most unexpected push of the year in many ways. And, uh, which is interesting because obviously they've been in the PC industry forever, but never this directly. And so I think this is going to set them up for a very interesting future. And I do believe we're going to see more surface device types, not the crazy stuff we talked about last week or two weeks ago, but, you know, touch ultra books, different size tablets, hopefully a, a small media tablet. And uh, if we're really lucky uh, or <laughs> unlucky, you know, maybe even a surface phone. And so, I think next year, and, and I should say all in one PCs too, um, I think they're really going to branch out. And uh, that is going to have interesting effects on all of these markets because for all of the, the little problems with the Surface, the one thing that's really positive about it is just the amazing Apple like build quality of the device itself. You know, the materials they used, the way it was put together, it's just a, it's just a beautiful, beautiful device. And I'm very interested to see what else they do. Um, with other device types. And finally, your number 10, Mary Jo Foley. Yep. My 10 um, is all these things that we've called Windows services. Paul mentioned uh, the, what do you call it now, Microsoft account as, as one. I'm, I also would bring in Outlook.com being introduced this year, mm -hmm. uh, which is the successor to Hotmail, basically. And SkyDrive this year got a ton of regular updates, which was really awesome to see because up until now, the Windows Live team, as we talked about on the show a few times, they've been very slow to update. And it felt like they were on the same schedule as Windows. Like every two or three years, you were getting updates to things that were services and you'd expect to be updated more quickly. So this year, we really saw a change in the SkyDrive rollout. They, they were really proactive, doing things on all different platforms, doing things on a very regular, almost, almost close to monthly basis, it felt like. Um, and Outlook.com, I, I really like this email service a lot. I, I'm trying to convert over to it, though I'm still having so, so many of my accounts tied to my Hotmail address that I've had forever. It's, it's tough. Uh, so that transition's a little bit rocky. I'm, I'm not sure how much smoother they could have made that. Uh, but it feels good. It feels like Windows services are now starting to get updated on a regular basis and that Microsoft really understands what it means uh, to have a service as opposed to tying it to software. Yeah, if I could just second that, I, I should have mentioned Outlook.com and yeah, that's SkyDrive true. and Skype. That, yeah. that, is, um, that is a big deal. And it's, it's, those are things that actually impact my own day every single day. Every day. Right. Yeah. Yep. Good yep. catch, Mary Jo. So she got that last one in there right under the wire. But is there anything, chat room, I would ask you, anything, they're talking about other stuff. Yeah, what do we got? <laughs> anything that we missed, it'll take a little while because uh, they're operating in a time warp. <laughs> um, yeah, I have, a, I have Windows for Live on Twitter saying, yeah, Outlook.com was a good pick, but st we still don't have the Metro-style calendar. That's true. Oh, yeah. um, I just asked about that today, by the way, uh, because I get that question all the time. And you'll be ecstatic to know that my response was no comment. <laughs> <laughs> I would expect nothing less. <laughs> uh, Xbox those guys, Smart Glass. Well, those guys are good about getting back to me, but they just don't have anything to discuss. Smart here. Glass was announced uh, at CES. We didn't talk about that. Uh, yeah, you know, but as far as Smart Glass goes, by the way, I, I'm a little amused at how excited everyone is about that. That said, I'm also 
pleasantly surprised by the way it's been evolving. So that that may, that maybe should be on the list. Um, interesting cross platform stuff there yeah. too. Yeah, Bert says, "What about Windows Blue?" I don't think that's, that's one of the top ten, that's, but yeah, next year. That's a year ahead. That's, that's, <laughs> that's going. That's going into twenty thirteen. Sure. Yeah. Um, Microsoft adopting antivirus technology in Windows eight. Finally. Yeah. 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 Not top ten, but a, certainly a worthy story. Yeah. Um, anything else, chat room? Uh, my expansion of the Microsoft stores is kind of interesting. That's actually a big story, given that uh, Apple's you know? done so well with retail, and Microsoft probably eyeing yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, the retail stuff wasn't new to this year, but they did expand it pretty dramatically, and of course, they did open the um, the temporary stores, some of which will be permanent. Right. That's a pretty good story. That that would definitely make the top twenty. Yep. I mean, Hadoop. We didn't have it on the list. Oh, I'm no, sure it's, on, it's on everyone's top ten, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Microsoft getting more active around Hadoop and having the Azure and the Windows <laughs> Server ports. <Yeah>. Big deal. <laughs> oh man. All right. Smoked by Windows Phone. Actually you could do a, a, a line item of Microsoft promotions for twenty twelve. They did some interesting stuff. Smoked by Windows Phone, Scroogled. Yeah. Um, it's all been downhill since Gmail Man, though, hasn't Gmail it? Gmail Man, <laughs> reading your email. They're really well. This was a year where Microsoft's anti-competitive ad machine kicked in. The the attack ads. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe that's I, um, the, that's the story. Yeah, I like that kind of stuff. And, and you know, I, and to put the Google uh, stuff about EAS in perspective, which actually, have we ever talked about that? Did we talk about that last week? I can't remember. No, I guess that happened in between last week and this. It happened so after uh, that so is maybe a, that we is should a big we story. should let's address. We that. should discuss that a little bit. But how you know, it doesn't hurt iPhone users, but it seems to hurt Windows Phone users. It's this is a really nuanced problem because ultimately this is like the apple maps thing they're they're hurting customers right. they're just hurting people that use their products it's kind of crazy um but on the other hand um january whatever day is going to come and go and the truth is no one is going to be impacted by this right away because anyone who has configured their existing gmail account to work on a mobile device this stuff will just keep working so it's um it's kind of a future problem which is part of the reason i don't think microsoft is going to address it too quickly uh, or at all by adopting support for uh, CarDev and, and CalDev, which would add the uh, the calendar and calendar. I'm sorry, calendar and contact syncing that will be missing when you don't have EAS. Um, but yeah, I, I, ultimately though, it's uh, aside from the customer angle, it's really about Google declaring more in Microsoft, which you know part of me has to kind of appreciate. Like I, I sort of enjoy when customer uh, customers when companies are very aggressive going after each other in that way you know that's it's why i like those microsoft ads like scroogled and uh, gmail man i just i it's it's that godzilla king kong thing i keep bringing up i just you were it's, always you mad wanna... that they didn't respond to the apple switch ads you really wanted them to go oh, in there I with did. their well, gloves they did. on okay they eventually they did but not in the way i wanted and, and they did the, it with churros response. no 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 <laughs> they did it with the i'm a pc campaign which was beautiful by the way it was right. uh, really uh, shut off the diversity of the pc world which I thought was just nice. And so, yeah, what I wanted was gloves off, uh, you know, street brawl. And they went for the kind of warm and cozy thing, which, you know, ultimately was probably the right approach. It's I just agree. that it took them too yeah. long to get there. And they didn't run it very long. That was, it seemed like a quick campaign. Yeah, I don't remember. It was a while ago now. Yeah. You know, the the other thing to mention on this Google EAS thing is that, what what another underlying reason for them doing this was, besides the fact they don't want to pay Microsoft to license Exchange ActiveSync, which is pretty expensive, supposedly. Um, mm. They they are trying to drive the Google Apps business to a paying business instead of having it be a free business. So the people who can continue to use uh, EAS to sync are people who are paying for a Google Apps account. So if you're if you're a business customer who would be typically the type of person who wants the EAS sync, you mm -hmm. have to have a paid Google Apps account to continue to get that, which is very interesting. So it's kind of Google pushing its customers to go the pay route and away from the free route. That's another way to look at this, too. There's, there's also there's another angle that kind of ties into that slippery slope thing I was talking about with ads in Windows uh, 8, where... Google is uh, pushing this notion of native apps. You know, um, for example, this isn't Google, but last week Yahoo announced that they were redoing all of their email stuff. And one of the one of the bits to that was that they have a 
a native Windows 8 app for Yahoo Mail. Now, I mean, uh, I don't know, some people might want a Yahoo Mail app, but it seems like the better approach is to integrate your mail into an email program where you can get e all of your email in one place and it's a consistent environment. You know, like why, why do I have a mail app in Windows 8 that has Gmail and Outlook.com and Office 365 in it, but then I have this Yahoo app that looks very similar but is not the same, and that one has Yahoo in it, right? So Google is pushing that same kind of strategy. They, they want you to use their native app on these other platforms. And, of course, they don't offer it on Windows anyway, so that's part of the Scroogled bit. But, you know, if you have an iPhone, for example, now you can get a – it's a beautiful app. I mean, you can get a really nice Gmail app. But it's, it's like the appification of these services. You know, I feel like Google and Yahoo, too, probably – don't benefit when you aggregate your email into a centralized location with other accounts, that there's no benefit for you to use Gmail and that it's less sticky. And that if they can hook you on a native app, they can do many things in the future, including, by the way, putting ads into it. You know, if you're not a paying customer, that might be one of the, way they, one of the ways they decide to monetize it. And so, uh, you know, this is that, like I said, the slippery slope thing. It's, it's a bad experience overall, I think, for users, but it's better for the company that makes the service. Um, and that's kind of a lousy reason to do something, it seems. Yeah. I, I, I point people to two, if you really want to understand this, the two blog posts that I found really helpful on this was one by Hal Berenson, who used to work at Microsoft on the Hal 2020 blog. Uh, the other one is, I think this guy is a, a, a Microsoft partner, maybe, or a service provider. Uh, his blog is called Thoughts of an Idle Mind. .wordpress.com and they both kind of agreed that this is more of a skirmish than an all out war and they explain why they don't think this is going to be a real deal breaker for Microsoft. Um, I, I think they both had a lot of good food for thought that's worth reading. Hmm. Good. Plus it's December so nothing's going to happen at Microsoft anyway. Exactly. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> yeah. the, the entire company I think is skiing right now. Everybody's <laughs> <Yeah>. gone. <laughs> You laugh, but I'm serious. They're no, all gone. It's true. They're all at the This Denali, is the one time of year you can get you can find parking on that Longhorn, campus. Longhorn, Whistler, <laughs> all of all yeah. the places. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, well, all right. So there's your top ten lists. <sighs> Thank you, chat room, for your contribution. Thank you, Paul and Mary Joe. The best stories, the biggest stories of twenty twelve. Uh, according to Paul and Mary Joe, the gospel of Windows Weekly. Are there any other before we get to uh, our picks and tips and so forth. Are there any other stories we want to talk well, about? Well, there's all kinds of little things going on. I mean, we talked about the Windows Phone updates, I guess. Um, I don't know, is any of this super important? Yeah. There's well, the Portugal uh, viral ad. The Portugal viral ad is pretty <laughs> What's that? cute. What's that? Should I play um, that? Yeah, it, Microsoft Lisbon office, I believe, is where this was filmed. We we put a link in there for this. It's a it's a Windows 8 ad that's pretty cute that made the rounds this week. The uh, mega whoosh water slide. <laughs> I was talking with a guy from Microsoft about this ad, and he was telling me that this proved that Windows 8 wasn't too hard to use, and blah blah blah. And he was going on and on about it. And I said, he, he, I said you should hire more kids to sell Windows 8. I'm, uh, child child labor is always the answer. <laughs> like, why, why, why wouldn't you do that i'll have to look okay i'm still searching for it i'm going to youtube and what no, no, it's, we have a link in the show notes i know yeah, but those are those are on my windows rt tablet oh. which uh, is not going to help me much in finding it so i'm going to look for microsoft viral ad uh oh, let's see if we can uh, we can give you the, na the, the name the name is called a small called demonstration a small demonstration yep there you go all right let's find it now here we go from Microsoft Portugal, ladies and gentlemen, we give you a small demonstration. Is Windows 8 really that simple, they ask. They have people in the Microsoft store looking at Windows 8. Hi, interested in a small demonstration? Yes, please, if you don't mind. Just a second, I'll call my colleague. Oh, this is the one where they get the kid in. A demonstration by... A small child who has to stand on a step stool. That's pretty funny. He says, hello, can I help? You want to help me? Go ahead. So he gets up on the stool. So Windows 8 first innovation is the password. You just draw on your picture, and uh, there's the dynamic tiles. Customize the screen. 
I love that he's logged in as administrator. <laughs> yeah. And then the guy looks really weird at him. So I guess this is a series of different customers looking at him as he comes in with his little stool demonstrating eight on the via. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That guy was a little too friendly. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Oh, uh, oh boy. Yeah, so glad you're here. Now uh, here's here's a uh, here's a business executives on a uh, three martini lunch. <laughs> right, it's yeah. Portugal. They probably have two yeah, hours. Yeah, that's right. Here's a surfer. Here's a hipster. Here's an old guy. Here's a young guy. Here's a mother. Here's a father. No, actually, he's got earrings. We don't know what he is. He's got a hard rack cafe shirt. Here's grandpa. Hey, what? I do the demonstration. He's got a Microsoft shirt on. Hey, come here. Look, you got a kid doing a demonstration. You ever see anything like that? Now, if they brought out a dog, I'd be impressed. Wow. Wow. Well, kids know how to do this. Come on. You know that. Everybody knows that. That's not saying anything. If you made an operating system a 12-year-old couldn't operate, you'd be out of business. (laughs) Wow. Seriously. That's... It's not... The problem isn't kids. The problem is grown-ups. Yeah, if they showed some IT managers demoing it, then we yeah. have to show a grandpa <laughs> doing it. That's the you know. I mean, seriously, everybody knows kids can use this stuff. Kids have always been better at this stuff than grown-ups, but it's cute, simple, it easy, Portuguese, Microsoft <laughs> Windows Eight. <laughs> Everyone is invited. No, oh, that's uh, that's cute. What memory do I need to install the new Windows? I'll call my colleague to answer that. <laughs> he has no idea. No, because kids, it's not about speeds and feeds. Oh, look at his colleague. Oh, that's cute. Wait a minute. i got to rewind a little bit. His colleague's a little girl. Oh, that's cute. Very cute. Nice. Yeah. The girl's when, getting the hard question. That's right. And <laughs> so that's one thing they're saying. They're also saying... Uh, girls are better at math, I think is what I just they're heard. They're also saying that maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe the subtext is this is for the next generation, right? This yeah. is this is the future. Wow! Yeah, look, you have you have really deconstructed this video. <laughs> you, yes. On on first viewing, you have. <laughs> I you figured have, it like, out. It's like you've, you've I destroyed solved the my puzzle. innocence. <laughs> no, that's cute. That's cute. It's, it's uh, Windows. Are you smarter than a fifth grader version? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and the answer is no. And the answer is no. So. Moving along, it's let's. I see the next item is Windows devices. What's up, Adam? Windows devices delayed. That's disappointing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sigh. Well, that, yeah, that, I, from certain we companies, touched right? on that in our list. Right? But that's the Clover Trail stuff that you were hoping it is for. Yeah, I have a Clover right. Trail machine, so I don't quite understand what the what the issue is with these other guys. Yeah. But this it, is it, Dell, Dell and HP delaying. Machines that were expected in December to January. <coughs> and these were the companies that both said we're not doing RT, meaning right. ARM. Yeah. I think yeah. that maybe they're uh, still a little miffed. Could be. A non tech says it's not power management issues, which is what we'd heard, right? Right. Yeah. No one seems to really know what's going on. Like people say it's the fault of the drivers. It's I've heard people say not enough components for the PC makers to get a hold of. <laughs> uh, but Anantech says not power not power management related. It's some other bug, which I don't think they actually ever detail in their story. They just said it's another bug that um, these people are encountering, but not everyone is encountering it for some reason. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you, which one do you have, Paul? Which Clover Trail do you have? It's a Samsung Ativ smart PC. Ativ. Ativ. And you like I hate it? that. By the way. I know it's terrible because nobody can pronounce it. I, actually, I do like it. I mean, uh, the Clover Trail platform needs to improve in some ways to support more RAM and so forth. But um, yeah, it's it's a it's certainly a viable alternative to ARM. In fact, it's superior to ARM uh, from what I can tell. Yeah, you know, no fans, awesome battery life, and it's compatible with all your software. Twenty eight customer reviews on the Best Buy site for Surface RT. Giving it a 4.7 you know, out of 5, according to Tom's. I, I don't remember where I told someone this today, maybe email, but I, I think there's a, a psychological thing that kicks in when you spend a lot of money on something. Yeah, you have to like where it. Yeah. You, you're justifying it to yourself and exactly. to the world that you did not make a bad decision. This. Yeah. Yeah, because 
you're, if you do say that, you've just said you're an idiot. Right. Right? Right. And I don't, want to, I don't want to read too much into it. And I don't mean to say that these people aren't actually ecstatic about the purchase. But I think you see that with Apple products, which tend to be very expensive. And you kind of want to justify it, you know. Yep. Um, every once in a while, you'll hear from someone who just says, oh, look, I bought a MacBook Pro because I want it and I can afford it. You know, well, excellent. That actually is, I have no I have no problem with that at all. But, you know, when you, people go to great lengths to defend a purchase like this, it's like, uh, like, really? I don't know. I, I, I'm a little leery of that. Yeah, it's it's not a it's not meaningful. Not a psychologist. No, you think you're right. I think you hit the name. That's how I see it. Yeah. No, but the other the other interesting part of that story too was supposedly a guy went in and went to a Best Buy. He didn't say where this Best Buy was because now they're showing off the Microsoft Surface there, and he said it was just horrible, like an absolutely horrible experience. Like the display had it locked down, so you couldn't use the kickstand. It didn't have the touch cover. You know that whole story. Okay. Because it's at Best Buy. Best Buy sucks. Yeah, well, yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, That's why Apple bet, opened its stores. They used to have special Apple yeah, stores yes. in Best Buy, and it was such a flop. Right. They had to open right. their own stores. Well, actually, right. they still have Best Buy little mini stores, but... They're I staffed think by Apple employees. Yeah, Microsoft so, needs to do this. Yeah. Uh, this is This would they be do. a great way to extend the brand without having to open those stores. Like, get an agreement going. And, you know, by the way, like, why wouldn't they have done this back in April... To prepare for Windows 8 and have this ready to go. Yeah. They're, they're, this is another part of the mistake where they're allowing other people to control their destiny. So you got the PC makers who are like running around bumping into each other like the Three Stooges. And then you've got Best Buy who, despite being a retailer, has no idea how to sell anything. I mean, it's like the, it's the most unbelievable, comically stupid combination of factors that confronts Microsoft every single time they release a new version of Windows and they still haven't fixed it. It's too bad. Or, or you go you go to the Microsoft stores where the people are very well trained, obviously, in, in all the Microsoft technologies. And you take them and you say, you're going to go to this Best Buy store. Because I can tell you, I've been to the Microsoft Times Square store a few times now. And those people are awesome. Uh, shout okay. out to that store because, wow, they're great. And if they could send some of them over to the Best Buy on Fifth Avenue, that would be really awesome. Remember uh, <laughs> during the Mojave uh, uh, project time period, Microsoft set up tents. Right. Outside yep. of Best Buys, that's even better. Get them before they go yeah. in the store. Don't worry about <laughs> that minefield in there that has like PCs with exposed power cables and it looks like someone <laughs> ripped it out of the display. Here's what the computers look like. <laughs> you know, rent, rent the parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. In New York, we don't have a parking lot, but you could rent the side. Right, right, right. Okay. Good, <laughs> yeah, good. You know, there's going to be a bunch of Christmas tree lots available in, uh, in, America, right? <laughs> in January. Yeah. Just in time for Surface Pro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to come back with uh, Paul's pick and tip, Mary Jo's code name of the week, our beer pick of the week, which has a very appropriate name. <laughs> before we do that, i got to tell you about Audible.com, the greatest place in the world when it comes to audiobooks, the biggest audiobook store in the world. And we're going to tell you how you can get one free. I want to mention one that's uh, that Audible just came out with. They do this every year. They do a kind of a a special where they get a bunch of different authors together uh, around a concept. In this case, it's called Ripoff. I love this idea. Mm. They get 13 of the best, most popular sci-fi, they call it speculative fiction authors together, and they give them the first sentence of a classic science fiction novel or, or, or whatever. For instance, uh, there's one where the, you have to take the first sentence, call me Ishmael, and turn it into something. Uh, nice. Your first sense of the Wizard of Oz, and you, it ends up being <laughs> in, an, in a hole in the ground. There lived a hobbit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Huckleberry Finn. So uh, there are. This is Elizabeth Bear and uh, John Scalzi and Jack Campbell and Paul DeFilippo, Mary Robinette Kawai. Great authors. This is a really neat book. Uh, they do this every year. They do something special like this. So this one's called Rip Off. But that's just an Audible special. This is this is how powerful Audible has become mm. in the in the world. Of publishing, they're doing their own stuff now, and and of course, every publisher worth their salt makes sure that there's an audible version available when the book comes out. Hunt, that's how you get a hundred thousand plus titles. Visit audible.com/windows. You can pick your first book free. You'll be signing up for the gold account. That's the book a month account. Your first credit's free. Your first book is free. Cancel at any any time, and the book is yours to keep. 
you'll be glad to know that uh, the ratings are in the best rated books by Audible listeners of 2012. Paul, the stand number one. Yeah, three thousand two hundred six ratings and a four point four. Normal. Probably because everyone who bought that book never had time to do another yeah. one. I listened to it so, all the way through. So, I loved it. 47 yeah, hours so and 52 minutes of golden Stephen King. Nora Roberts, The Witness, number two. I haven't read that. Shadow of the Night, Deborah Harkness. Tricked, The Iron Druid Chronicles by Kevin Hearn. Kill Shot by Vince Flynn. A lot of uh, series books. I have to agree on this one, No Easy Day, by Mark Owen, the first-hand account of uh, the Osama bin Laden mission, which mm-hmm. was great. Mm-hmm. The Hobbit's in there as top ten. What are you listening to, Paul? What do you like these days? I just went back to uh, one I had done a while ago called uh, Team of Rivals, the political genius yes. of Abraham Lincoln. Did you see Lincoln um, yet? Because that No, that's why I'm doing yeah. it. And I'm intrigued by this story um, because I feel like this is something that we could benefit from today, this notion of... No kidding. Cross uh, the aisle. Bring, part non- yeah, yeah. yeah, you don't see enough of that no, um, no. anymore. I listened to this and I loved it. I thought it was really good. Yeah, it's a really good one. There's, there's an unabridged and an abridged version. And the unabridged version is almost as long as the stand. It's like 41 hours, 30 minutes. Oh, you know, I must have listened to the abridged edition because I don't remember. I can't it, imagine. Yeah, it, it's. That's read by John Boy. Uh, Richard Thomas. Not, Isn't that no, John the, Boy? The oh. abridged version is. That's what I meant. The, yeah, 41 yeah. hours if you get the other. Uh, you know what? I must have listened to the abridged version. Oh, how funny. I didn't even know I was doing that. So now I have to go back and listen to the full Actually, hour. you know, in this case, that might not be bad. <laughs> it was kind of short. It was nine and a half hours, which is a yeah, normal yeah. book length. Yeah. So did you listen to Unabridged? Yeah. Well, now I have I to... haven't. I've had this for a while, so... Um... I didn't realize it was that long. But I like the John Boy version. I thought that was very good. And and while we were, and while we were doing the top ten list, I downloaded that um, Audible app for Windows 8. It's... It's okay. Um, I'm looking at it, and I can tell already there's a bunch of little areas they need to fix. You know, for example, the the main title at the top says my email address apostrophe s audible. You know, rather than uh, Paul's Audible or something. Right. You know, it's got little things like that. So they'll clean that um, up. They'll clean that up. It's a 1.0 release, yeah. but it's nice. Hey, to that's see good it. news. So is that for Surface RT or Surface Pro? What is that? It's for everything. So it works on RT. Oh, it works awesome. on awesome. I'm downloading so, yeah. now. Yep. Fantastic. That's such a. That's so great. Yeah, I need to play. I can't do it while we're recording, but I mean, obviously, you want to see if, how it works. Uh, right. You know, do you, can you play it in the background? Can you put it on the side? You know, I'll, have to, I'll, I'll have to play with it. But this might it's make, not bad. make the Surface RT my uh, my reason for living. <laughs> well, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've said that. Yes. <laughs> my reason for where's the search on this store? I can never Windows find Key it. Q, or it's in the in the Charms Bar. Oh, Charms Swipe. Bar. Yes, I always forget. Swipe in. I always forget. Audible.com app. There you go. All right. So, folks, you can, now you can get it everywhere. Windows, iPhone, Metro, everything. It's on Windows Phone. Windows Phone, too. It has been for a while. Windows Phone version has obviously come along nicely, too. That's a, that's a good one. This is. I'm excited about it being available on... Uh, on Metro, That's I wish Amazon would do this with everything they own. I want to see, uh, you know, Amazon MP3 appear on these platforms, uh, the video store, you know, instant video. Yeah, let me see. Audible was installed. Oh, this is exciting! When I see that Audible logo, I love that. That makes me happy. Look at now; it's on uh, Windows 8. Audible.com. I'm going to sign into my account, and I'll let you know how it works. That's cool. Audible.com/slash yeah. Windows. You too could be an Audible user. And now that uh, they're on Windows 8, there's no excuse. Give uh, give it a try uh, today. All right, Paul, your tip of the week, sir. Yeah, I, you know, as you may know, I'm, I'm working on a free book about Windows Phone 8. And one of the first chapters I wrote before I had a Windows Phone 8 device was about uh, Bing Search and Maps. And now that I have a Windows Phone 8 device... I realize I'm going to have to go back and edit that pretty dramatically because one of the things that Microsoft left off, not that it was actually in Windows Phone 7X per se, is uh, this notion of speech-guided turn-by-turn, right? Mm, yeah. Um, the way it works in Windows Phone 8 is that it's an add-on. And so you get a Maps app for free, and you can do directions. Um, it It's pretty bare bones. And in Windows Phone 7, they had this kind of... Uh, kind of a kludgy thing where you, you you had to tap each step along the way and then it would audibly say something. Um, it wasn't true 
speech guided turn by turn. And so Windows Phone 8, you can add on to Maps. You can add it you know, with, an, with your own app. And obviously, if you have a Nokia device, you get the first class experience with Nokia Drive, which you get for free. It's one of those things that they make, and so they can give it away. But if you have a different kind of device, like an HTC 8X, like I have, and like Mary Jo has, um, you're kind of at the whim of the wireless carrier because they may or may not bundle something on there. So, for example, on AT&T, the app they want you to use is called AT&T Navigator, and it's not actually that bad, but you have to pay for it. So you can actually pay for it on a per-use basis. So if you're going on some road trip, you could pay for 24 hours of use, and it's I think it's $2. Um, you can pay for it on a monthly fee, which is the old way of doing this kind of thing. Or you could buy an app um, where you just you know pay for the app, and then you can use it going forward. And so one of the apps I've tried out because I've been sort of investigating this is something called Navigon, which I think is owned oh, yeah, by... Oh, yeah, I like Navigon. Yeah, I, I use that Star on the... Garmin? Yeah, I use that on the uh, iPhone and iPad. Yeah, yeah, it's a little expensive, but um, this week, Christmas week, I guess it's on sale. So the U.S. version is $29. Oh, that's a good deal. Yeah, and if you don't have a uh, free turn-by-turn -turn on your Windows phone, that would be one to consider. It's a really good one. Um, I travel internationally, unfortunately, so... Uh, the European there's like a European version of the app, and that one is sixty nine dollars on sale. So I suspect it's a lot more money normally. Um, but if you're not getting it for free, it's a way to go. So I guess the tip is simply that uh, to understand that this is the case, that this is how Windows Phone works, and that when you're buying a smartphone, this might be one of those things that you take into consideration when you're making your choice. You know, we talk about apps, we talk about uh, the various ecosystems around you know music and podcasts and videos, you know, TV shows and movies and so forth. Um, I've talked a lot in the past about the the importance of the camera being very good on a phone, which is now possible. Um, but if you need this kind of capability, I think turn by turn should factor into your uh, decision making process as well. And so, obviously, if you have a Nokia device, you're all set. That's that stuff's great, and it works all around the world. It's got awesome capabilities. But if you don't, um, you just need to understand you're not getting that um, for free when you get Windows Phone. By the way, I am. Uh let me show you. I, I've been using the uh, Audible app. It's pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, it looks. I mean, it uses the screen beautifully, which is nice to have a. Whoops. So when you go back to your uh, the main page, yeah. you'll see it's downloading my library, which may take a little <laughs> while because I'm also downloading a uh, a book. So I, maybe I well, maybe I froze yeah, it. It looks, it. Like it looks like it's dead. It's frozen, <laughs> frozen, frozen. Come on. Oh well. It's working great. It looks good. <laughs> if I could only show it to you. You would, oh, forget it. All right, so what I recommend is <laughs> yes. uh, manu you can manually close the app. Yeah. Uh, see if you can drag down from the top of the screen and kind of trash basket it. In the in the app? Yeah. Okay. This is good. This is good. This is on live troubleshooting. So drag from the top. <laughs> yep. And see, draw all the way down. Oh, oh, it's, it's it all, 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 all. Uh, I don't know if that did it. Well, try running it I again. I think it did it. It's gone. Okay, so now I'm going to run it again. I don't know how to do that because uh, did it install it somewhere? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, look at the end. Yeah, it's at the very end. Yeah, so it lets you, you know, yeah, pin yeah. individual titles to the start screen, which oh, is pretty that's nice. That's kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah, yours is working great. <laughs> Crashed again. Well, <laughs> it, it it is working fine here. I know that's a, a not that's an anom an anomaly, oh. but I am putting it on the front there because I uh, I'm an as you know. I like Audible. I'm sure this will be all worked out. I haven't applied the updates yet, so probably there's an update that I need. <laughs> yes, it's a, right? It's a very glass half full. Way to look <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you. I'm sure you're right. I'm sure it's just that. <laughs> I'm sure it's just that. All right. Continue you on. Do have, Paul. You do have approximately 117 uh, apps to update it according to Windows Store. So you. Yeah, there are quite a few, <laughs> actually. Yeah, you noticed that, did you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. This is the problem with Windows 8, too, by the way. You know, you, you get into that same situation that you have on a smartphone, where every time I look at the damn start screen, there's some app that needs to be updated. What I, I no, like how Android does it. It does it automatically, and I just right, wish like, it would why, do Why that. is that not an option in Windows yeah. 8? That's crazy. Yeah. And before anyone writes in and tells me that it is, it isn't. There's an, <laughs> it isn't. You have to manually tell it to install the apps. It will download them automatically. It, it shows you on the badge and everything that, it, that it's going on. Yeah, yeah, I don't like that. I just want them to install. Yeah, but I'm with you. Anyway, they'll get there. It's a maturity thing. Yeah. Someday this will run. Someday, yeah. my... Oh, here we go. 
There we go. Now it's running just fine. Yeah, nothing's going to go wrong this time. Nothing could go wrong. And you're right. There's that apostrophe. Yes, there's a little. Yeah, space isn't that terrible? There. And yeah. there's like a space, you know? It's, yeah, it's just like, little things like that. It's like my first Windows 8 app, you know? Yeah, they'll fix that. They'll yeah. fix. I love the idea, you're, though, that it's on the. I R2. suspect that yours is not working well because you have you must have a crazy huge library. I do. And it's so and it's a ton to download. Is. And that's what took so long. And yeah, it's also just, downloading a, a book right now. So. Um, yeah. That that probably was a mistake too, but I, I think it's nice. What's also nice is, unlike iOS, you can have the store in the app because Apple, of course, doesn't want you to do that. Yeah, although by the way, uh, look at how they do that. It's not that's not very elegant either. If you tap one of those, yeah, it comes over on the side. Then you have to right. log in again, or I had to log in again. Oh, uh, that's in. annoying. All right, maybe they uh, I guess you yeah. did. So yeah. no, and, uh, samples and everything, which is kind of nice. So. Yeah, you yeah, know, but I don't understand a, why the a, store isn't a full screen experience. Like it's you're right. I do have to sign in again, don't I? It says that right. Yeah, there. yeah. Weird. Yeah. Huh. They'll get there. It's it, again. It's one point oh. One point oh. Hey, I am I am thrilled that they have the commitment to it, <clears throat> and they got yep. it, and they got Me it too. done. Right. I mean, that's Me that's too. really what we want. All right, your uh, software of the uh, week. This is kind of a weird one. You know, Live Mesh uh, or Microsoft announced this past week that they were going to finally discontinue Live Mesh, as expected, right? Because they have the SkyDrive app. And there are a couple of features in Live Mesh that are still not available in SkyDrive. And it's, I believe I have heard from every single person on earth who uses Live Mesh. They're freaking out. Um, it doesn't do P2P sync. You know, it doesn't have remote desktop. Um, they, these people are really antagonized by this stuff. Um, there's a product called Cubby, which is made by LogMeIn, which does offer P2P sync, meaning PC to PC, uh, in this case, like peer-to-peer -peer sync. In other words, syncing content between your computers without it touching the cloud. Um, but the way SkyDrive works is you store everything in the cloud, and then you choose which bits of it to sync to each PC, but there's always a master copy in the cloud. I happen to think that that's the right way to do it for most people, but some people want this P2P sync feature. Um, Cubby offers this. It's going to be part of a paid version of the product, unfortunately. So at the time that I wrote this software pick, uh, Cubby was in beta, but actually, I believe since then, it, they might have just released the non-beta version. No, it's not as special. Uh, they have special beta pricing. So the way this is going to work is that the pro version of Cubby is $7 a month. But if you get the beta now, you can get it for three ninety nine a month, four dollars a month, um, and that will give you, among other things, direct sync, which is that peer to peer syncing feature. Cool. Um, some people need it. If you need it bad enough, I guess you'll be happy to pay for it. I suppose, but it doesn't seem like it seems like what people really want is the just live mesh back and free PC to PC sync. So right. um, the other alternative, which I did install on Windows 8 just to make sure it worked, but I'm not going to use, is something called SyncToy. Uh, SyncToy is, uh, began life as a Windows XP power toy, if I'm not mistaken. It's been around forever, like 10 years. Uh, it also does PC to PC sync. And you basically set up sync folders that will maintain uh, their contents between two different computers. And... Um, you know, there's probably some tricks to getting that to work over the internet using VPN or whatever. But um, if the PCs are on your home network, certainly it works well. And I did used to use this to sync content from a PC to a Windows server I had at the time. I'm not going to use it now. I, I, like I said, I installed it just to make sure it's still all there and it works and everything. But um, I know people don't like to pay for things. So uh, if Cubby is not your cup of tea and you still want P2P sync, I guess you could look at SyncToy. I'm, I'm going to do an app pick. Because our Twitter, okay. Dimitri Lialin has put the Twit app in uh, the um, uh, Metro store. So I'm very pleased to say for $1.99 now you can have Twit on, uh, on Twit TV on your uh, desktop. And he did, he did a great job for, uh, with the Metro app. This is very similar. Yep. Yep. Uh, thank you, Dimitri, for doing that. And I uh, encourage everybody to uh, pick it up. Actually, no, this is FCon. This is a different company. Is interesting, it? yeah. They do an Android yeah. version that I like, F-Con software. That's interesting. I guess Dimitri hasn't done this yet. Uh, so anyway, great. Highly recommended. Twit.tv. We, we need the Windows Weekly logo on that picture, though. Yeah, why it's isn't it, huh? I don't know. That's Shame. Odd. Shame. That's <laughs> odd of all the shows that you'd have on there. I know. Well, it seems like it'd be, it's kind of crazy to have, you have Tech News Today, Know How, Android, This Week in Enterprise Lost Tech, weekly. before you buy Floss, <laughs> Frame Rate, <laughs> i5 for the iPhone. Come on, <laughs> FCon Software. 
There it is. <laughs> there it is. Paul and Mojo together at last. <laughs> <laughs> Highlighted. I just want to go on record as saying I will never refer to you as Mojo. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Aren't I sweet? Yes. Thank you very much. So uh, now we have our enterprise pick of the week, Mary Jo. Yes, which is also an app pick this week. Um, in the Windows Store for Windows 8 and Windows RT, there's a new app called MSDN and TechNet Top Blogs. So if you're somebody like me who tries to scroll through the hundreds of MSDN and TechNet blogs through RSS readers or some other way every day, yeah. this could really save your bacon because it takes the top 20 MSDN blogs, top 20 TechNet blogs, um, and it puts them in a single view so that you can just click on like the IE blog and scroll through horizontally, of course, since you're going to use it on your Windows 8 machine, probably. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you can just see all the top posts. It's it's a pretty nice app. I've been trying it out today. I, I just found out about it today thanks to Richard Hay uh, at WinOBS on Twitter, and he he alerted me to it. It's a really good app, though. If you if you like to keep up with the top Microsoft TechNet MSDN blogs, this is a nice way to do it. Very nice. Mm. Code name pick of the week. Code name pick of the week is Wave D. And this is really interesting. I had never heard this code name till this week. Uh, what it is is a code name for the for Windows Intune. Windows Intune oh. is Microsoft's PC management service, and because they're constantly iterating on it, and they don't really call them new versions, they're just always updating. They've taken to using letters instead of numbers. So. They're up to their fourth version as of this week, uh, which just went live this week. So Wave D is the fourth iteration of Windows Intune. And the next one will be Wave E, obviously. Uh, but what's what? why I made it the pick of the week this week was I don't think a lot of people know that it's gone live. Uh, so if you're somebody brand new buying Windows Intune for the first time and you buy it as of December 17th, which was Monday, you're going to get this new version, which is the one that supports Windows 8, Windows RT, Windows Phone 8, and it's very key to letting you manage Windows RT devices because, as we know, you can't join a domain with, with Windows RT. But the way you can manage it is through Windows Intune, which uses Exchange Active Sync as one of the protocols for management. Um, it also uses new Windows agents that install on your devices. So even on iOS or Android, uh, sorry, not Android, just iOS, Windows 8, Windows Phone 8, and Windows RT, you get an agent uh, as another way that you can choose to manage with this version of Windows Intune. So that if you hear about Wave D, that's what this is. Uh, if you're a current customer, you're not going to be able to get these bits until January, like around mid-January next year. Cool. I do have the, uh, the Twit app running now, so let me just show you yeah. real quickly because I do want to show you that, uh, in fact... Windows Weekly does appear prominently. I think this must be in order of posting. Like, these are what's out right yeah. now. Because okay. there, there you are, Windows Weekly, Paul and Mary Jo. And uh, there's all the episodes. Beer and Cookies, our most recent. This is a, this is a nice app. So this is from F-Con. They do the, uh, the app I recommend on Android, actually. I don't know if... I wonder if Dimitri's going to do one. And there's the live video. And look how good that color rendition is. Hello. It, it also uh, supports Play 2, this app, so you can watch the, them ah. uh, on your TV via your Xbox. Yay, that's great. It's probably still getting the, uh, the image. It's, take, it's just loading it. There it goes. Hey, there's. look at that. Mary Jo Foley just said something, and there she <laughs> is. That is bizarre. <laughs> I don't know how we're doing that. She's coming from the future. The Mayans were wrong. This is cool. I'm so happy to have this. Thank you. This is great. Uh, all right. Finally, we cannot end a show without a tip of the uh, of the flagon to our beer of the week, Mary Jo. Yes. Uh, and we're going to do a little Christmas theme, of course. So of course. beer pick of the week is called Criminally Bad Elf. <laughs> Yes, yes, this is a real beer name. It's um, an English barley wine. That's a style. So it's very high on the alcohol, 10.5. Good Christmas no. beer. Uh, and it's from Ridgeway Brewing in the UK. And if you ever look up their beer list, it's kind of hilarious because they have Bad Elf, 
um, seriously bad elf, criminally bad elf. They have. Uh, <laughs> He's getting worse. That's great. <laughs> yeah, insanely bad elf. Whoa. And they also have reindeer droppings and Santa's butt. I don't think I want that. Uh, I don't think you want that. Nor, nor do I. They have lump of coal. As is well. a now so this is a barley wine. Is that uh is that still beer? Yep. It is still beer technically. It's just a style of beer. Okay. Um usually very high in alcohol. Uh, usually uh or many of them I know taste like tropical fruits. So a lot of papaya <coughs> and, oh, interesting. And, and all that. Good good Christmas beer. Interesting. And this is if I could. Of, yeah, yes, Paul. Um I have also tried a couple of Christmas beers recently. Yes. Oh, nice. And uh, my my favorite beer of all time is um a delirium tremens, <laughs> yes, and uh, yes. they make a delirium Noel, which is actually not very good. Uh-huh. It's it's just okay, but you're probably familiar with Chimay. You know they have the blue, the red, Love and the Chimay, yeah. kind of yellow color beers or whatever you know labels. Um, their Christmas, actually, it's not a Christmas beer. I guess it's a the call. I am not going to pronounce this right. It's the special sense and quant. You know, it's like a anniversary beer, which is very expensive. Um, that is amazing. Oh. That is one of the best beers I've ever had. Oh. And where do but we the get delirium this? Noel was disappointing. Saint Sicant means five hundred years. Is there? Have they I been think, around yeah, that yeah, yeah. long? Wow. wow! Anything that's associated with like a monks in an abbey, yeah, is probably okay. Well, that's you know? what I'm drinking. The uh, Quant- <laughs> Carante Trace is eighteen hundred years. Speaking of which, yes. um, the Untap service, which, which I think Mary Jo talked about a few weeks ago, you know, they have that app on Windows Phone. Yeah. I cannot get that to work. Oh. I know. Every time it's, I search, I, I search for a beer and I can't find it. Oh. So you can type now, in something, something like happened. Sam Adams. Yeah, I don't know what happened. It's like it's disconnected from the back end or something. Yeah. Very disappointing. I hate it when that happens. I think they yeah. drank a little too much criminally bad elf. And uh, This is why cloud computing doesn't make any sense, Mary Jo. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> cloud it's computing. all wrong. Disconnected from the back end. Cloud computing is a lie. <laughs> use the web app. Use untap.com on right, the web. Yeah, yeah, what, what are your plans for the holidays? You going home for the holidays or anything? You doing anything yep. special? Mary Jo? Go, going up to my mom's in oh. Boston. Oh, you'll be uh, near near Paul. You should come by. You should. I Steven should. Sanofsky will be there. <laughs> Maybe I won't. He's, he's camping for the weekend. It's going to be the craziest Christmas since that Star Wars Christmas special in 1978. <laughs> it's the most crazy time of the year. And, Paul, I take it you're hunkering down in Dedham. And, uh, yeah, and, we're home. Yeah, that's great. Well, have a wonderful holiday, both of you. Thanks. Have a what safe doing, new year. I'm staying home, too. Just uh, nice. You know, I, I just had my long vacation, so now it's time to, to stay home. We're going to take most of the week off at Twit. Best ofs mm-hmm. for most of the week uh, or various holiday things. For instance, Twit on Sunday is the special, the holiday special we do with John Hodgman, Jonathan Colton, Paul and Storm. Uh, John nice. Roderick will stop by. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and then uh, we do a best of uh, for many of the shows. So, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a quiet week around the old studio. I think a lot of uh, infrastructure improvements planned. Uh, all right. Well, have a great holiday, you guys. We'll see you next you week with our best of episode and then back live. Uh, let's see. That's, I think, January 3rd. We'll be back live with uh, Windows Weekly, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC on twit.tv. Or uh, download audio and video after the fact. It's wherever you find podcasts, including the Zoom Marketplace and so forth. Not yet on Xbox, the uh, live TV thing, but we're going to work on that. We want to get an app for the Xbox. Anybody can help I us. I think with you that. should. Yeah, we'd like to do that. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Mary Joe. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week on Windows Weekly.